The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 8370 in the name of Andy Whiteman on Homes First. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Andy Whiteman to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Presiding Officer. Um, I thank those members uh, from all parties uh, who have signed my motion and have turned up this evening to contribute to this debate. Uh, can I also welcome uh, those in the public gallery, many of whom are living with the impact of short-term lets every day of their lives, and I hope today can bring some assurance that Parliament is willing to tackle this issue with some urgency. My motion highlights an issue that is of significant concern to very large numbers of my constituents, and it's on their behalf that I speak today. To begin with, I want to clarify what this motion is not about. It is not about the collaborative economy where people rent out a room in their house on a peer-to-peer -peer platform. It is not about the platforms themselves. It is about the framework within which decisions are made, or currently not made, about the very existence, extent, scope, and nature of the use of residential property in their entirety as short-term letting businesses. Short-term letting has a long history. I'm sure many members have hired a self-catering property in rural Scotland, for example, for holidays. In rural Scotland, such properties form an important part of the tourism economy and provide valuable income for local businesses. In most cases, however, such properties are detached dwellings and have received planning consent for use as a self-catering property. Nevertheless, even in rural Scotland, there remain issues to be resolved about the extent of second homes and short-term lets in areas of acute housing need. But it's in Edinburgh that the phenomenon has taken off and where the implications of this unregulated market is causing severe distress to the quality of life of my constituents. These include antisocial behaviour within communal areas, a loss of community as speculators buy up properties and turn them into short-term lets, mental ill health, including anxiety and stress associated with not knowing who's coming and going, the displacement of the residential population as homes are acquired as lucrative short-term lets and those that are left are left to decide whether to stay or not. A tax gap as thousands of properties are not on the valuation roll and pay no non-domestic rates. And finally, concerns over security as keys are distributed to hundreds of unknown persons every year allowing access to residential areas. On one online advertising website, there are 5,474 whole properties available for let in the city of Edinburgh, almost double the number in July last year. And this is despite a City of Edinburgh Council presumption in planning against any short-term lets in flatted properties, yet thousands exist. It is despite thousands of domestic dwellings having conditions in their title deeds restricting the use of property to a main home and prohibiting any business use, use, yet thousands of owners are flouting these conditions with no redress available to affected neighbours. And a tax system that's meant to ensure the payment of non-domestic rates to ensure this, uh, to support the provision of public services in the city is failing to collect over £10 million due, due to owners not declaring their properties and because of the 100% relief granted through the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Presiding Officer, I reiterate that the mischief complained of here is not that of homeowners renting out rooms as part of the collaborative economy. It is the situation whereby changes of use are taking place to residential property with no democratic scrutiny or accountability, and properties are being marketed to tourists despite those properties not complying with the law. It's a situation that's causing a degree of stress and misery that should not be tolerated, that causes, for example, a school pupil to fail her exam because of lack of sleep due to an unannounced party by strangers in the flat above her bedroom. Other testimony is as follows. We have lost a neighbour and gained an endless stream of strangers. Cheap holiday lets come at a very high price for people living next door to them. What was our neighbour's house is now a hotel with no planning permission, no safety, reg safety regulations and no regard to families living next door. I am leaving the old town, my home for the past 25 years. I have sold my flat and I'm moving out in January. 
I have nothing but feelings of utter contempt for the selfish and irresponsible people that have done this. And the Council have been both complicit and complacent, presiding over an increasingly dire situation, only interested, it seems, in turning the city centre into a transit camp. For the record, those were some of a very, very large number of testimonies that we've received over the past few months. Presiding officer, this motion is called Homes First, and that is the name of a campaign I launched yesterday to tackle this scourge. Homes First means what it says. There is an affordable housing crisis in this city, and what residential accommodation that does exist should be used to provide homes for residents in the first instance. Only through a careful and considered process in the planning system should any short-term lets of whole properties let out on a commercial basis be allowed. The human rights of my constituents to housing and to the peaceful enjoyment of their property is being violated by the rapid and uncontrolled expansion of short-term lets. One constituent observed recently to me that there are three key factors that have led to the rapid growth of this market. Cheap flights, online accommodation platforms, and wheelie suitcases. And members here today, before the close of this debate, can, if they so wish, easily book a short break in Madrid, Paris, or Berlin from their mobile phone or tablet device. And whilst this has created unprecedented freedom for some, it has caused untold misery for others. And so to resolve this issue, we need to recognize two distinct issues. The first one is how we give councils the powers to, defect, to effectively decide the appropriate scale, location, and scope of short-term lets. That is a first-order question of how property is used, a question normally addressed by the planning system, in particular by the land use class order system, and a first order question as to whether short term lets should even exist in any given location. The second question is how we effectively regulate the operation of any short term letting system and how we manage the impacts. That, presiding officer, is a second order question to be addressed once we have dealt with the first question because it is not a question that in itself resolves the core issues, which is where and in what circumstances should a change of use be allowed from a domestic dwelling to a commercial short letting business. To conclude, presiding officer, a modern day clearance is underway as long established communities are torn asunder in the face of global market forces. Across the rest of Scotland, two changes underway in towns and rural communities as this new wave of cheap travel disrupts local housing markets. As I said at the outset, this motion and this campaign is not about the collaborative economy, it is about the exploitative economy. And I urge the Scottish Government to wake up to the need for action to tackle this issue before it's too late, to listen to the concerns of residents whose lives are made intolerable, intolerable by a market that is out of control and a system of regulation that per permits widespread illegality. Could I ask um, those observing from the gallery to neither uh, holler, clap or boo? <laughs> and uh, we move to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. Uh, ben McPherson to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, presiding officer. I would first of all like to commend Andy Whiteman for bringing this matter to the chamber. As MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith, like Mr Whiteman, I have also received concerning correspondence from constituents about these matters and issues, particularly from constituents of mine in the Abbey Hill colonies, not too far from this parliament, where people have spoken about the increase in noise, the uh, disruption at different times of the day, the strangers turning up, uh, damage to community, and all of the other aspects that uh, Mr Whiteman highlighted. And while uh, the experience and the constituent responses that we've had may be anecdotal, it is clear that there is a, a trend, particularly in Edinburgh, where this situation is, and the antisocial behaviour and disruption associated with it is causing great concern for individuals and communities affected. And I know that will be particularly pertinent to individuals uh, and constituents watching the debate today. Uh, in seeking to take action on this, like Mr Whiteman, uh, over the, the last months, uh, in, in agreement with, with the, the general consensus that he's put forward to, to take action, 
I have been in correspondence with Scottish Government colleagues, whether that be with uh, Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown and also with uh, Minister Kevin Stewart, and also with uh, the City of Edinburgh Council and, and, and colleagues there. And I think uh, what's uh, clear is that we do need to think considerably and purposefully about what action needs to be taken, both using existing law and whether there is any change or, or, or new initiative required. However, in order to do that, my strong view is that we need to make sure we do that on the basis of robust empirical evidence and consideration and do that in a way that we make sure that any new initiatives that are taken forward are, are robust and uh, effective. And, and uh, I'd be happy to take a, a short intervention. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome uh, Ben's support for the uh, motion. Um, he talks about the need to, to get uh, reliable information, etc. Does he accept that the uh, voluminous testimony is if not uh, statistically verifiable, is nevertheless uh, enough sufficient evidence to suggest that we do need change in the way that properties are used for short-term letting businesses? Ben McPherson. I, I do empathise with that position. However, I think that we need to work with the government, both at a local authority level here in Edinburgh and at a national level in order to make sure that we do act on empirical evidence. And that is why I have written to both the Minister Kevin Stewart and to colleagues on City of Edinburgh Council to uh, acquire where they are in the process of uh, gathering evidence on this matter and uh, what actions they are considering taking thereafter. We also await the findings of the advisory panel on the, the collaborative economy. So, uh, it was on that basis, and, 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 and call me semantic, but I just uh, wasn't uh, in a position where I felt that, that because the motion didn't make reference to that need to gather evidence, I, I wasn't able to support it as drafted. But I absolutely agree with the sentiments within it about the fact that this is a huge concern for many constituents here in Edinburgh and elsewhere. Commend Andy Whiteman uh, for the, bringing the motion to the chamber and look forward to working with him, the Scottish Government and local, uh, local government here in Edinburgh in order to make sure we tackle this issue for the benefit of those communities and con individual constituents who are being negatively affected. Graham Simpson, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Can I also thank uh, Andy Whiteman for bringing this issue to Parliament. His motion raises uh, important issues, particularly here in Edinburgh, and I don't disagree with him when he says there's been anxiety and distress among some residents over properties being let out short term. He uh, spelled out the situation very eloquently. Um, but I do just need to urge a degree of caution. There's a danger um, that on issues like this that we can take knee-jerk reactions before knowing the full picture. We should not be complacent, but we do need some balance. Tourism is vital to the Scottish economy. According to the Scottish Government, spending by tourists in Scotland generates around £12 billion of economic activity for the wider Scottish supply chain and contributes around £6 billion to Scottish GDP. Short-term lets are a part of this important economy. Uh, in addition to supporting over 15,000 jobs, self-catering attracts 723 million pounds in consumer spending, 470 million of which is spent by visitors to Scotland. In fact, in Edinburgh uh, and the Lothians alone, self-catering supports over two and a half thousand jobs and brings in nearly 50 million pounds to the capital. And the headline objective of Edinburgh's own tourism strategy, Edinburgh 2020, is to increase the number of visits to the city by a third. Yep. John Finney. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the member accepting intervention. Would the member accept that the local authority, one of their major obligations, is to house their population? <clears throat> Graham Simpson. Uh, I'm coming on to uh, the council. Um, now, in Edinburgh, there are officially uh, 1,000, uh, well, just ne nearly, nearly 1,300 self-catering units 
uh, on Lothian's roll. Now those are units that are let for over 140 days a year. I accept they're not the ones that Andy Whiteman is talking about. And they can be seen as commercial enterprises. Uh, I myself, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, a keen user of self-catering properties, um, stayed throughout Scotland uh, uh, and Europe uh, and elsewhere. Um, now the motion states that residents are being displaced when properties are rented out short term and I suppose that's rather stating the obvious but as I've said tourism is vital where, wherever you go not just in Edinburgh. Now well I've taken one I don't really have time unless I'm allowed more time. Yeah okay. Cassia Dugdale. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I'm sure if he uh, was faced with a constituent affected by antisocial behaviour in a community, he would call for greater support from the police and greater interventions from the police. When such antisocial behaviour is happening within a tenemented or a flatted property, did he not understand the need for greater regulation given this new phenomenon? Graeme Simpson. Well, I'm rather minded to um, agree with uh, Ben McPherson that we need to get the full picture here. We need to know the facts um, before we rush to regulation. It may well be necessary, but we do need to know the facts and figures. And on the data issue, um, there have been concerns raised at the Scottish Government's own panel uh, on the collaborative uh, economy about the validity of some of the scraped data that it, that, that's been produced. The discussion paper from their June meeting uh, recognised that some of the data from third party websites was, quote, open to dispute. Um, so I think we need to work with um, pe pe people like Airbnb um, and others um, to, to get things right here. It's right that if there's an issue affecting communities, to raise it, but often the solutions can be found through dialogue rather than regulation. Um, we do need to avoid harming the tourist industry, but if there is an issue, let's get the facts. Let's get the facts first. Uh, and if we need to regulate, then we should do so. Pauline McNeill, followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make a, a short contribution, presiding officer. I'm very mindful of Andy Whiteman's opening remarks, um, that it's about a specific uh, motion. I hope that Andy Whiteman will not mind if I speak to that, and I think a, a related issue, which I think um, is pertinent. Um, I think he makes a, a, a really good case for some action and regulation based uh, on, on Homes First and the situation he outlines um, in Edinburgh. And I can't say for sure whether there's any comparison between Edinburgh and Glasgow here. But I have to add in that in Glasgow City Centre, um, both myself and Patrick Harvey have had representations from residents who feel similarly that the proliferation and the combination of short-term leases speculative buying in order to be Airbnbs and for the purpose of short-term leases is absolutely interrupting with people's peaceful enjoyment of the properties. And what concerns me, and this is where I think there is a similarity here, is that whilst no one wants to uh, prevent the economy um, from booming and where people would take advantage of global platforms and cheaper opportunities to um, to, to use um, a, a property for the time that they're staying in a city. It should also protect communities in that regard. In Glasgow, there's been a rise of 184% of listings in global air and B, uh, A and B platforms. But importantly, 56% are entire home rentals. But it has a similar impact, and that is that people feel there's no security where they live because so many people are coming and going from their tenement uh, homes or their, their flats um, and people don't always take responsibility and there is definitely evidence of antisocial behaviour in many cases. Just in conclusion, my feeling is that there does need to be a look um, at a whole range of these uh, issues around short-term leases and b and b just to see if there needs to be some further regulation to protect communities. Because there's no doubt in some cases the balance is definitely being interrupted. And I think the primary aim, if you encourage people to come and live in the city centre, you're also entitled to be treated as a community as well. 
And I think that governments and local authorities need to protect people um, who choose to live in city centres. And if that means we need to look at a little bit of regulation, then I think that's what we should do. Thank you. Mark Rustle to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Andy Whiteman, my colleague, for bringing forward this important topic for debate in Parliament today with his usual blend of forensic analysis and passion for change. I think, Presiding Officer, at the heart of this debate is a question about what kind of communities are we actually trying to create. There's something here about the art of placemaking and about whether councils actually have the right tools to make our places sustainable places. Um, why do we want to visit beautiful places as tourists in the first place? We visit them because they're authentic and because we can share a moment in time, feeling what it's like to be part of a community and part of its culture. But when we undermine the very qualities which draw us to visit communities in the first place, and that's then we, when we need to step back and question some of the market forces at play. Um, and I went to Cornwall this summer with my children and greatly enjoyed playing in fishing villages along the coast. But we kept asking what the black boxes with the combination locks on every single last door were actually for. And there was a creeping sense that the authenticity of many places were being hollowed out by near universal short-term letting of every single residential property. And when I wander around the East Nuke fishing villages, I see little black key boxes steadily increasing as well. Fife is the second highest number of self-catering properties in Scotland which is a good indicator of a growing tourism economy, but we also need to be mindful of striking a balance. And there isn't a right or wrong answer here. It's about careful judgment, but we need to first understand how big the short-term letting sector is, what it brings to communities in terms of benefits and disbenefits. Then we need to have the right tools to mold the growth of the sector in a way that doesn't compromise the quality of life of residents, and to also ensure that it makes a fair contribution to local economy, yeah. Graeme Simpson. Um, can I thank Mark Ruskell for taking the intervention? Is, would he agree with uh, myself and Ben McPherson then that we need to establish the actual scale of the problem before we decide on any action? Mark Ruskell. Well, I would say the best way to establish the scale of the problem is to actually give councils the right regulatory powers. If you give a power to a council under land use classes, then that will force the investigation. It will force a conversation in communities about the impacts of short-term letting sector, both positive and negative. So let's start with the power. And in the East Nuke of Fife alone, there are 500 self-catering properties registered with the assessor, which are eligible for rates relief, most of which, of course, don't pay council tax either. And through non-domestic rates relief alone, this equates to half a million pounds lost in tax revenue every year and alongside that there's also the informal unregistered short-term letting sector using online platforms in the East Nuke which could also be bigger than the registered sector. So this combined loss of public revenue could be spent for example on reopening St Andrew's Rail Route which would bring huge benefits to both visitors, the tourism economy and, and locals alike. In terms of the impact on housing availability and quality of life, I agree this does need a more detailed local conversation. But in order to get there, we need to give councils the powers under planning use class orders. And this move would put short-term letting onto a better spatially planned footing, one which makes it transparent and accountable while recognizing the positive economic impact that it can have. Now, councils already exercise powers to cap the number of houses of multiple occupancy in student areas, for example, a move which I, I would argue is far more controversial than any cap on short-term lets because students are in genuine housing need and are members of communities rather than just visitors for the weekend. Likewise, on alcohol licensing, boards can consider policies on over-provision and limit licenses. If we're prejudicing public safety in an area through over-provision of alcohol sales, then licenses can be declined according to lines on a map. So councils routinely make decisions to allow the economy to grow in a way which doesn't undermine the fabric of communities and their needs. And presiding officer, if we, to finish, if we want to protect, protect our communities as authentic and beautiful places to both live and visit, then we need to heed the concerns in Andy Whiteman's motion and give councils the powers to actually get this balance right. Gordon Lintas to be followed by Kezia Duffield. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I begin by referring to my interest as a registered landlord within the Lothian region which I represent, although I'm not engaged within the short-term letting market. Um, I have myself lived in flats in this great city of Edinburgh on and off for many years and have personal experience of the irresponsible behaviour that others sometimes engage in. Loud noise at late hours of the night, rubbish left in stairwells, lack of respect to fellow residents, and other antisocial behaviour that Andy Whiteman has already referred to. It can be both frustrating and at times life-destroying for those who suffer th from this. Such behaviour is, of course, not limited just to those who stay for only a night or two, but I think it is fair to say that a very different relationship does come to exist between long-term residents and those others who may pass like ships in the night. One of the most important aspects of democracy, in my view, is for members of the public to exercise their right to contact their elected representatives. So I would like to thank all of those who have written to me about this issue since I was elected from places as far apart as Marchmont, Brunsfield, Merkiston, and South Queensferry. And as Andy Whiteman has pointed out, issues raised by short-term lets are not entirely new but because I recognize the importance of this issue, I was happy to support his motion, which raises awareness here in Parliament and more widely of this important issue. Positive points, of course, should be made. Edinburgh and Scotland are very successful tourist destinations. Short-term lets are a lucrative business in Edinburgh and a testament to the popularity of our city for tourism. But we do need to strike a better balance, I think, between Edinburgh's popularity and the sometimes unwanted consequences of that success. Many residents feel a sense of loss of community. Relationships that are built up over time in a stairwell of flats, for example, is something they used to cherish, but now can only crave. Short-term tenants aren't around for long, and little, if any, relationship is built up. Now, there have been ideas that have been generated about how we can overcome these problems. For example, the government's own expert advisory panel on the collaborative economy may provide insight into how policymakers can overcome some of the resulting social problems that we have talked about. Government, parliament, and stakeholders should work together to enable informed decisions to be made in addressing concerns without shutting down the short-term letting market altogether. Overregulation, of course, could have that effect. Making it harder to navigate red tape as a host could impact on the estimated 500 million pounds of economic activity generated in the last year by hosts and guests. Council budgets are continually stretched. Are they ready to take on the administrative role of dealing with a new use classes order, for example, or short-term let planning applications. These are just some of the questions that we need to think about on this issue. So in closing, uh, I'm just closing, if I may. In closing, we should respond, but we should also guard against overreaction, overregulation, or anything that would be mere window dressing with measures which sound good, but do not have the desired effect. The last of the open debate contributions, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I do the obligatory thanks to Andy Whiteman for bringing uh, this debate forward this evening, but also go a bit further and commend him on what is an, an excellent and very thorough piece of work, which I think it recognize, um, demands and needs its own plaudits and in its own right, uh, and very specifically to um, note how forensic uh, this is a piece of work with regards to the need to look at change of use and how we can better regulate uh, short-term lets across Edinburgh and indeed Scotland. I think it's worth taking a moment to consider how the Parliament has addressed issues like this before. I've been involved around housing issues in Edinburgh for 10 or 15 years now, back to the days when I was a student activist supporting uh, the student community around houses of multiple occupation because, of course, a piece of legislation brought in to improve the standards of, of housing was for a time used against young professionals and students in Edinburgh with the idea of quotas which the Liberal Democrats at the time were actually uh, proposing in order to limit the density of HMOs within certain communities which had its merits as an idea but wasn't going to tackle the underlying problems. 
Then that debate um, morphed into a debate around party flats in the city. And in the last parliament, Sarah Boyack did a lot of work around party flats in the Grove Street area and indeed on the south side of the city. And I mentioned these presiding officer because what we require is a legal system that's light on its feet, that's lithe and uh, agile enough to adapt to new and growing circumstances. And we couldn't have anticipated Airbnb when we were putting forward uh, the HMO legislation a few years ago. So it is important that we revisit these laws and consider whether they are fitting for the time. Um, in all of uh, the contributions I've heard um, from those who aren't as favourable of Andy's proposals, uh, the idea of data scraping has been mentioned and it also filters through all of the briefing papers we've had from Airbnb and the Association for Self-Catering -Cater Companies um, who are against any sort of further regulation. And I would suggest to Graham Simpson and others that people arguing against data scraping perhaps have a vested interest in it. It's very clear to me that there are merits for having quality empirical evidence. We also support that. But the idea that Airbnb might not like us making our own assessments of how many properties are available in Edinburgh does, uh, demands a degree of greater scrutiny. It's a bit like asking uh, airports to be responsible for their own carbon emissions or indeed, dare I say it, asking Tories to be responsible for their own tax returns. What we need is independent uh, analysis uh, of the data, yes, but let's not discount what we can see before us. And if you spend five minutes on the Airbnb website, for example, I know other companies are available, you you will see the litany of properties across uh, Edinburgh that are available for short-term rent. Some of them are new and can make a bit more progress and then let you in, Graham, because you were kind enough to, to uh, let me establish the point and then, I'll, and then I'll give way. If you look at the website, you will see there are brand new properties um, where there are very often wooden floors that shouldn't be there because building regulations have been ignored. There are lots of continual problems around noise. Likewise, there are lots of older properties and tenement buildings with their own cultural uh, awareness around stair management that people visiting for one or three days won't be aware of and that's where these issues around community are so important and people have to have a bit of give and take and a bit of compromise when they're living at such close quarters but the problem here is the introduction of profit into this notion of community which I'll develop a bit further once I've taken the members intervention if he still wants to grant it. You've not got too much longer Mr Dugdale. I'll Graham Simpson. Thank, thank you very much I'll be really quick and I, I'm just confused about what you're saying uh, about uh, the data um, do, do you agree that we should have accurate data or are you happy with, uh, you know, sort of da data scraping? Give you another minute, Ms. Dugdale. Thank you, appreciate it. Of course I want accurate data, but the member has not demonstrated why what's been put before him is in any way inaccurate. His only evidence is from those vested interests involved. So I don't think it's a black and white uh, scenario. The point I want to make here is about profit. And I'm very grateful to Andy Whiteman for identifying uh, the fact that people using Airbnb and other companies uh, aren't paying non-domestic rates. But there's a wider issue about tax here too. It was George Osborne who said that, uh, that people could uh, earn additional money from Airbnb without paying any income tax. In fact, they can earn up to £7,500 through letting out a room or, or indeed their whole property that they own. I think that needs to be addressed. Furthermore, had we given local authorities the power over a tourist tax, we might be able to apply that tourist tax to people who are participating in this type of letting. And finally, presiding officer, uh, very specifically on the proposal that Andy's putting forward, he uh, references class order uh, arguments about how we could use that to uh, better regulate the system here. I've tried this before when we had a debate in the last parliament around... Um, the proliferation of payday loan shops. I tried to introduce a new class order system then so we could treat those applications differently from other retail use. I found it immensely difficult, but I, I would uh, very much like to discuss that further with the member either in this cha chamber or beyond it. I wish him well. It's an excellent proposal. It has the support of a vast number of constituents that have contacted me, and I'll do anything I can to support uh, Andy Whiteman's um, proposals as they go forward. Uh, before I call the Minister, can I remind members that even in members' debates, it would be helpful if you would use the full names of colleagues because that helps the official report and is, it also brings clarity to those that may be listening in. I now call Kevin Stewart to conclude this debate. Around seven minutes. Is it seven? Um, Kevin, seven. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Um, and thanks to Andy Whiteman for bringing the debate to the Chamber today. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to close the debate for the Government. Um, the debate itself has raised a number of serious issues that merit discussion. Uh, and none of us want to see any situation where a rise in short-term lets leads to the displa displacement of residents or the erosion of communities. The accessibility and ease of technology 
has led to the rise in online platforms which have made it much easier for individuals to market their accommodation. Um, this has broadened the type of accommodation for visitors to Scotland and across the world. And this new model of tourist accommodation is now an established part of the overall short-term offering provided both online and offline. But we must be aware of the downsides of the growth in short-term lets, uh, such as those that we have heard about today uh, and that I've heard about previously, um, which give uh, rise to concern. And I, of course, take this very seriously. I myself uh, represent a city centre seat. Um, Anti-social behaviour, a noise nuisance, a loss of a sense of community, a loss of amenity in the area and all the possible ne uh, negative impacts that there can be uh, on the fabrics of our towns have all been discussed here today. Now, local authorities already have powers, um, quite comprehensive powers, to deal with antisocial behaviour and noise nuisance. And I expect them to use those powers effectively. And as recently as 2011, we passed an order in this parliament to take um, a, a kind of holiday, uh, houses used for holiday purposes. The Antisocial Behaviour Notices Houses Used for Holiday Purposes Scotland Order 2011. And I wonder how often that is being used here in Edinburgh and elsewhere. And I would challenge the local authority to look at using that and other antisocial behaviour powers, um, as well uh, as noise powers, environmental health powers, that they currently have at their disposal, I'll, I'll take you in a second, that they currently have at their disposal, um, I would urge them to use them now to deal with some of the difficulties that folk are actually facing today. I'll Thank you. That's a very welcome point, Minister. I wonder, though, whether you would recognise that these powers can only be actively used if they're properly resourced. And historically, in Edinburgh, we did have anti-social behaviour teams. We had a noise helpline and a hotline. In fact, we had wardens to address this. And all of these have gone because of cuts to local authorities, because they're not a statutory requirement. They were the first thing to go. Surely we need resources in order to use these laws actively. Kevin Stewart. Presiding officer, uh, local authorities are responsible themselves for the use of resources. Um, and I think that local authorities um, have the responsibility to respond to their residents. And obviously, uh, as has been highlighted, this is an issue for many people in Edinburgh. And I would ask Edinburgh City to look very carefully um, at what they are doing uh, in these regards. I think Mr. Whiteman was wanting to come in. Andy Whiteman. Yes, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Thanks, Minister, for taking the intervention. I accept what you say, but the, pr the problem with short-term lets, of course, is by the time somebody phones up the council um, and they uh, visit or whatever, often the visitor's gone. Um, or if they're not gone, they're going the next day. And then the next week, there's another issue, and they phone the council, and by the time they come, they've gone. The, the, these powers are valuable, but they're not particularly helpful where you've got a, a market that's expanding so rapidly. Kevin Stewart. I think that these powers are maybe not being applied properly, and this is the difficulty in all of this. Uh, and I will certainly discuss with this with Edinburgh City Council, because that notice itself, the anti-social behaviour order, is not served on the people who are there, who are necessarily causing it, but served on the landlord. And I think that's extremely important. So this issue of folk being away, etc., should not affect that in any way, shape, or form. It is a notice that can be served on the landlord, and I think that's important. Um, the issues around short-term lets are complex uh, and we need to understand these properly if we are to put in place effective measures to tackle these problems. And that's why the government commissioned uh, research on short-term lets earlier on this year. And it's why we've asked the Scottish Expert Panel on the Collaborative Economy to consider the impact of growth in peer-to-peer -peer accommodation through collaborative online platforms, not just in relation to the contribution to Scotland's economy and the opportunities it presents, but also to consider any regulatory, economic and social challenges that arises from these changes. The expert panel is chaired by Helen Goulden of the Young Foundation, and it will ensure that the wider economic, social and community impacts of the collaborative economy, including taxation, social inclusion and employment conditions, are taken into account. I'll give way very briefly to Mr Whiteman. The very, very Andy Whiteman. Very grateful to the Minister for giving way. Let's accept that the... the, the, the um, uh, the remit of that inquiry is the collaborative peer-to-peer -peer economy where someone rents a room in their flat to somebody else who's visiting the city. As I made clear in my opening remarks, 
Uh, that is not the focus of my concern. The focus of my concern is whole residential properties being converted to short-term lets for commercial use. That's not the collaborative economy, that's the exploitative economy. I understand Kevin exactly Stewart. where Mr Whiteman is coming from, but I think this work needs to go forward, and I will look at other evidence as well. Um, Mr Whiteman knows, presiding officer, that I'm a pretty pragmatic man when it comes to certain things. Other evidence I will look at as well, but I think it's very important that we see the findings um, from this group, uh, which is looking at not just um, uh, urban, uh, an urban setting, but also a rural setting. And I see members from rural constituencies here, and Airbnb and other uh, platforms like it are vital to the survival of the tourism industry in certain parts of Scotland. We have got to get that balance absolutely right, and I look forward to their findings. Um, the government also recognised the intrinsic links between building housing and inclusive growth and between providing warm and affordable homes and tackling inequalities and poverty. Uh, and uh, increasing housing supply across all tenures is, of course, a priority for this government. And that's why we're investing £3 billion during this parliament to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes. As well as working towards this bold and ambitious target, we're also working to increase the supply of homes through our wide-ranging review of the planning system to improve its effectiveness. There's no doubt that the increase in the use of whole properties in cities and in rural areas for short-term lets is a direct response to our thriving tour tourism industry. And just a few months ago, uh, we see Scotland, uh, uh, Rough Guide readers voted Scotland the most beautiful country in the world. Uh, and in 2016, we welcomed 2000 2.7 million overseas visitors and 11.5 million domestic visitors to our cities and to our unique countryside. And that, of course, generates 11 billion pounds of economic activity uh, and supports some 217,000, sorry, presiding officer, jobs across the country, including 34,600 here in Edinburgh. Um, and I think we need to take account of the tourism-related industries and their importance in this city and right across Scotland. Scotland's economy benefits hugely from tourism, but it should not be at the expense of local communities. Now, say that again. It should not be at the expense of local communities. We need to find a way to continue to welcome visitors to our beautiful country, offering them safe accommodation that is good quality while ensuring that local residents can continue to live and work in our town centres and our rural communities. The Scottish Expert Panel on the Collaborative Economy will report to ministers at the end of this year. I'm sure we'll all be interested in its conclusions and want to carefully consider what planning, fiscal or regulatory measures would enable local government to provide effective controls over the change of use of residential property to short-term let property. I once again thank Mr Whiteman for the opportunity uh, that I've had to address the Chamber today. Thank you. That that concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.